it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Oran. Oran is one of my uh, oldest friends. Uh, uh, we met back at Mila. I think that back at the time it was uh, even called Lisa. Um, it was Lisa, yes. <laughs> yeah. He, he definitely taught me a lot throughout the years. Uh, uh, I remember when uh, uh, in a pub uh, he drew me the uh, inner mechanism of uh, uh, an LSTM and began to explain me what an LSTM was. So I'm sure he will uh, teach us a lot today as well. Um, more formally, um, Oran is currently a research scientist at uh, Google Research. Uh, he's working on sequence modeling, multitask learning, uh, large scale uh, neural network, uh, and optimization problems, especially with uh, applications uh, to na natural language uh, processing uh, and vision. Uh, before that, he was uh, a visiting researcher at Facebook um, in Paris. Um, where he was working on a multilingual uh, sentence uh, representation. And uh, he was a research scholar at IBM uh, um, Watson, um, working on zero resource uh, machine translation. And uh, uh, as I said prior of that, he was a visiting PhD student at Mila, uh, again, working on uh, neural machine translation. Uh, so he has very extensive uh, uh, knowledge of uh, neural machine translation, which is the topic of today's talk. Thank you, Aran. Thank you, Francesco, for the warm and uh, generous introduction. Um, I also learned a lot throughout those pop settings, <laughs> I should admit. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing uh, the summer school, and also thanks for inviting me. So today, the talk that I'll be uh, the, the the topic that I'll be talking about is going to be uh, recent advances in natural language processing. Uh, but I'll, I'll be taking side steps and I'll be looking at the problem from a machine learning perspective as much as I can. I also try to make the talk uh, a little bit more abstract. So although it's natural language processing, towards the end of the talk, you'll see natural language processing is actually moving towards other uh, disciplines or other fields like vision, speech, uh, et cetera. So it's like we are going to start for an NLP, uh, but we'll end up with a merger with other disciplines and fields. Okay, let's start. All right, uh, I want to start uh, by highlighting a fact that I noticed. Um, we used to present slides. We've used to start presentations with a, with an opening slide that we, uh, we we talk about what we are envisioning, what we are planning, and so on. But these days, um, something has changed in the opening slides. I think uh, you might have already noticed. So we open our slides with successful applications of machine learning um, in general. Uh, and I think it's a testament of the practicality and utility of the field. Um, so what, uh, what the reason why we start with this, I think, is machine learning consistently delivers. Um, so here are a few examples what it's doing nowadays. So this is one example that the, the, the you're seeing on the left. It okay, popped up uh, last week, actually. Uh, and here you're seeing um, um, a, a merger of image, oh, sorry, vision and text, uh, at vision and NLP. Uh, there you're giving uh, a, a composite model or some parts natural, some parts coming from natural language processing, some parts coming from uh, VAE, some parts coming from vision. And you're giving a text prompt here you see on the top. Whoops. Can you see my pointer? I think That's you can. Cool. Okay, cool. You. So here you, so the, this model is called Delhi, and you're giving a text prompt and then asking um, the model to generate something, an image, an armchair in the shape of an avocado, or you give the model uh, both a text and an image prompt. So you're giving the first row here, you see the cat image, and you also you're describing what you want to do with that image. So the exact same cat on the top um, uh, as a sketch on the bottom. So it's quite interesting. Right, and we are seeing another trend. So this was the um, it was like merger of image and vision and, and NLP, but we are also seeing a consistently um, or, or the progressively improving trend uh, for machine translation as well, which is the topic that I mostly work on. So here you're seeing the development uh, or improved quality over the years on y-axis, and on the uh, x-axis you're seeing the number of languages 
that, that are covered with a single uh, machine translation model. So as you see, towards the over the course of the years, you're actually improving the quality uh, using NLP methods that based on deep learning, machine learning. And this is like one of my favorite examples because I cannot, I'm really bad at writing regex. Uh, so here we are querying GPT-3, we are uh, harnessing its uh, few shot learning, power, learning capabilities and we're describing what we want to do. Find a valid URL that starts with PhD with this and we're giving an example of what we want at the end. So, okay, let's wait for the next example. Sorry about the GIF. Um, so find an uppercase word with lane five and example is magic, and it gives us the regex that returns us, that, that regex that, does the, that does the job for us. So it's interesting that uh, this model that's, that's we are that we are querying is not trained on this particular task. And also it is not being updated or it's not basically using what, what, we are sent, what, what we're giving as an example here in the middle box to update its internal weights. Everything is happening at inference time on the fly. So I'll talk about this too. I'll be touching all, all these, the, these components, but I hope I, uh, I, I, I managed to spark some attention in the morning. So, okay, our agenda, we will go over five topics. Uh, as the case study, I, uh, I have a case study that, that, that I'm discussing some of, some of the open problems uh, on a particular problem, which we call M4. And M4 stands for like massively multilingual and massive neural networks for machine translation. So it, it actually harbors a lot of uh, problems, and it's uh, there are a lot of applications of machine learning uh, problems um, in, in this case study. But I'm not going to be covering that. But just FYI, if you're interested, what are the recent applications or what are recent problems emerge out of this problem, this case study that you can apply your knowledge and machine learning? So please take a look. All right, so the first part is going to be about the building blocks, sequence models in terms of the, what I mean by sequence model. I'll talk about language models and then I'll go to sequence to sequence models. Okay, so here is my abstraction of a machine learning problem. Um, I decompose usually, this is of course an incomplete picture, but kind of satisfies the, the necessity uh, of NLP domain. So we have a function f, we have this function inputs three uh, variables, x, theta, and mu, and this function at the end returns mu quality. So what are the inputs? So the first one, x, is, is the input. So it's basically any sequence, I'm giving a, a set of sequences that are arbitrary length. Theta is my model. So model defines how I parameterize the, this, this function. Uh, it, what I mean by parameterization, basically architectures, neural wiring, and so on. The last one, I bundled objectives and hyperparameters. So what is my loss function that I'm optimizing? What is the optimization routine that I'm using or training algorithm that I'm using? And all the other hyperparameters that are governing uh, the oral structure. There is also one more crucial component. This is often overlooked, but it is quite crucial. That is systems. Systems enable all these, uh, all, systems orchestrate all the, uh, orchestrate the coordination between all these variables. Um, without systems, um, the distribution training or model and data parallelism uh, won't be uh, possible. So this is often overlooked, um, but I just wanted to mention. In this talk, we're only going to talk about x and theta. I'll leave the mu part in the, uh, uh, I think, um, Macarelio is going to talk about uh, training objectives and loss functions uh, later today. OK, let's dive in uh, how our data looks like. Oh, the input variable x look, looks like. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to try to abstract the problem into a sequence modeling problem. And here my x or input is a sequence of elements. And these elements can be tiles of, uh, tiles of an image uh, or uh, frames of a video or a speech signal or a piece of text. Um, in some problems, in some data sets are coupled with two sequences, or there are multiple sequences involved in, in, in my data. So here we call them X and Y. And X is usually considered to be input sequence, Y is, is going to be my output sequence throughout the talk. And what the, my goal is going to be uh, given an input sequence X uh, of length um, TX. Uh, I want to generate the output sequence y of length ty. 
So the crucial point here is source sequence and our target sequence are arbitrary length. They don't have to, they, they don't necessarily need to, need to match. The particular problem that is involved, that, that is trying to solve this problem, the, 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 this particular approach that's trying to solve this problem um, is sequence to sequence paradigm, which is quite effective that, that can deal with multiple sequences. And what are the instantiations of uh, sequence to sequence paradigm? Machine translation is one. I'll give a French sequence and I ask, I'll ask the English, the English counterpart. Uh, sentiment analysis also can be cast into this framework. I'll give a sequence. I'll ask the the what is the um, what is the sentiment. Uh, speech recognition audio. Uh, I'll get I'll ask um, to get a transcription of it. Image captioning again, uh, and so on. So there are so many other problems that I didn't actually mention here, but it's quite generic framework solving sequence to sequence problems. Uh, but like, what is the amount? So I talked about the nature of the data. What, what about the amounts of this data? So amounts is nowadays it's quite large. So if you look at BERT, which is a model that we're going to be lightly cover, uh, it's using the entire Wikipedia. GPT-3, it's using a subset of the web. And M4, that is the case study, it's using the entire web. Um, there is another paradigm, actually, it's emerging, already emerged, maturing up. Uh, it's converting compute into data. So here we're seeing, we're seeing examples in Alpha Zero, OpenAI Five that that does the self-play, um, or Alpha Stars is Alpha Star is also doing that. So there we are computing, we are basically converting compute into data to be used by other models uh, for training. Okay, let's look at the model part here. Um, in the model part, I'll start with simple example of uh, how we're uh, processing an input sequence. So I'll be given an input text, the cat set on the mat, EOS, it, that here stands for end of sequence token that we, um, that we append to every sequence, just to hint, okay, this is the end of the sequence to the model. Um, this is my input text. Uh, the, my goal is, in, is to encode this input sequence. So to be able to encode, I have to learn representations for this. And how am I gonna learn this representations? I'm going to map the sequence of the discrete tokens into a continuous space so that I can operate on this continuous space using the neural networks that I have. And my principle is going to be, I want to maintain the context across all these tokens, and I want to extract the semantic information. I want to, I want to extract the meaning out of the sequence. So how are we going to do it? So I'll be given an input text. First thing, uh, we're going to convert it into some integer values. Uh, how are we doing it? We define a vocabulary. This is mostly a pre-processing step. After you define this vocabulary, you map uh, these integer value values into, you use these integer values to index a word embedding uh, matrix. This matrix is also sometimes called lookup table. Uh, there you basically convert integer values into continuous space. After doing this, let's now look at how we process only one token or only one or first element of this sequence. So once I have the continuous values, I can operate, I can actually um, throw my neural nets at it. So neural nets, I, I, I think you, you folks covered already, they consist of squashing functions uh, at, for every hidden unit. And what these squashing functions does, the do with the hidden layer, they, they transform and then squash the representations uh, or the state. And then I'll finally, I'll, I'll stack more and more layers. And at the end, I, uh, just right before classification, uh, I'm going to put a, a final classifier, final classification or regression layer uh, that is going to be manipulating this transforming, bending, and squashing the operations that, that I applied on, on my input, sequ input token. But this was for only one token. So what happens, like, uh, what happens if I have a sequence of tokens or sequences of elements? So now and at least the sequence is going to be arbitrary length. So there comes the problem. So previously, I defined a few for neural net. Uh, but I can apply the same neural net on every token by adding every element of this input sequence by adding a feedback loop. And if you add a feedback loop, this uh, basically becomes an RNN. Um, this feedback loop creates a recursion, or the, and then the, we call these models recurrent neural networks. And if you unfold this recurrent neural network, it also looks like a, um, nothing but a directed graph. So RNNs are quite... Um, uh, quite powerful models. Uh, they're still they use they they very quite so they they very quite 
uh, powerful and they are still quite powerful. Um, in theory, uh, just before they were replaced by transformers, which I'm going to be covering next. So they have some assumptions, the non-Markovian assumptions, so that, that it allows them to process uh, infinite context. Um, and they directly model the conditional probability. So this joint is basically factorized uh, as, a, as a multiplication of the uh, conditionals. So the goal here is of an RNN is uh, given an input sequence up to X2 here, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll try to predict the uh, next token uh, in the sequence using this formulation here. And they are quite expressive, as I mentioned. This expressivity uh, is great, but it doesn't mean that we can train these, to be, we, we will be able to train these models or scale these models. Okay, so we talked about language, model, language models using RNNs in a nutshell. And now let's look at uh, sequence to sequence models. Sequence to sequence models, uh, previously we were modeling X, now we're gonna model uh, the conditional uh, I'll be given the source sequence X, and I'm, uh, I'll be trying to uh, model P of Y given X. And this, like anything that you, like anything that you try to model this uh, conditional, you can pretty much use a sequence to sequence models to do that. Here, uh, a sequence to sequence RNN that is ingesting an input sequence given in, in green and trying to generate an output sequence that is given in red. Uh, so a little bit of jargon, jargon here. Uh, the encoding function or the feature extractor function in, in, in a sequence to sequence paradigm is called encoder. And the, the other function that I generate an output sequence is, called, is usually called decoder. And I'll be using this jargon too. So how, like given an encoder, like I'll get the encoder representations. How am I gonna generate the output sequence? I'll generate the output sequence one token at a time autoregressively one after the other, uh, and until I generate this uh, special end of sequence token here, as you see as this. So there is a problem actually here. Um, if you have noticed, uh, let's, to, to, to highlight the problem, um, let's, let's look at how far we can, we need to carry the information about an element in the sequence uh, without losing its information or uh, learning signal in the backward pass. So I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to show how the information is carried in the forward pass, but also imagine what happens in the backward pass. So if I'm processing the first token, and if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to, extra, to, to get an output to predict an output token, it's, it's quite easy. The credit assignment path is quite small here. But for longer, as the sequences get longer, uh, the, the, the carried information has to go through a very, very long path. And we know as the models get deeper and deeper, they become harder to carry, harder to train because the information is being lost either in the forward pass or in the backward pass. So this is known as, a, um, as the information bottleneck problem. Here is an actual example. So on the top, you see an English sequence, and I want to translate this English, English sequence into uh, another uh, French, in the, into French language. So if you care, and by the way, this is a very short sequence considering all the, uh, all the link distribution of machine translation. Um, but if you think about the influence of the first token in the source sequence to the infinite, uh, for the uh, final, um, final element of the target sequence, it has to go through, um, it has to go through number of steps that is equal to the sequence length. That's the summation of my source sequence length and the target sequence length. So this creates the information bottleneck. So although I mentioned these RNNs are quite expressive, so you can compute a lot of functions, they're actually too incomplete. It doesn't mean that you will be able to train these models. Training, I mean, uh, how easy uh, it is to fit this model uh, to the data. And if I cannot train, then how am I gonna scale uh, or ingest more and more data, right? These are the questions that we're gonna be tackling. So there's an actually interplay between these two variables, um, the modeling expressivity and optimization trainability. Um, so in a, like my conclusion is training RNNs is damn hard. Uh, and this long-term uh, long dependencies and the bottleneck problem can be mitigated uh, by using um, skip connections, but skip connections that are structured in a different form. Uh, we are going to be structuring skip connections just like residuals. 
uh, but we're going to structure them in a way that uh, the skip connections will be weighted. Just like residual connections improve the trainability of feed forward nets, uh, these weighted skip connections, which we call attention, is also improving the trainability of uh, RNNs or any other sequence models. So now let's look at attention. This is a sequence to sequence model with attention. On the top, again, I'm using the, I'm, I'm encoding my input sequence. And at the bottom, I'm decoding one token at a time. And in between, you see an attention uh, module or an attention network. So this attention network uh, yields um, some weights here that are uh, colored in from light to dark uh, purple. So lighter the, the, this connection, it means the influence of the hidden state, less hidden state, uh, for the uh, state that I'm at in the decoder is weighted by the attention weight that I'm going to be computing. And if you look at here, so the, all, the, all the input states are connected, connected to my uh, decoder state by using these weighted connections. Um, so if I have these weights, if I have, have these uh, weighted connections, uh, what can I do as I process? I can actually take the weighted average of the entire input sequence, given these weights, um, to, yield, to, to basically uh, summarize the entire input sequence. And think about the backward pass. Weights also have different interpretations. Sometimes they call them importance. Some, some people interpret them as similarity or relevance. But at the end, these weights, of the, um, the, 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 these weights are what attention network yields. Okay, now, uh, what does the attention do at the end? So this problem, if you think about the entire, the, the all target states in the decoder, and for each target state um, or each decoder state, I'll be given a list of or a sequence of weights, right? Yield, um, yielded by the attention mechanism. And for each one of those target states, uh, I'll have a, say, vector, uh, weights. If I concatenate all of these target states, uh, it yields um, an, an alignment matrix. And this alignment matrix uh, is used a lot uh, to interpret the bug uh, and also understand what these sequence to sequence models are doing. But at the end of the day, the problem is reduced to an alignment problem where we want to align two set of vectors. Uh, I want to align the target, the, 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 the state of the decoder with the states of the encoder. All right, let's now look how we are, uh, let's, let, now let's look um, at, each, at how each of these weights uh, in the attention are computed. Um, here, let's look first, um, I'll be given, uh, let's hear the attention network is sketched. So what I want, given, in, given an input set, here, set of values that are coming from either encoder or any other uh, set of um, states. Um, given these set of values, I want to get a summary of this input set based on how similar they are uh, given a query. This query, um, I changed the notation a little bit or jargon a little bit. This query is basically the hidden state of my decoder in the, exa in the previous example that I showed. And the state, the set of values or the set of states or values uh, can be hard to operate on because of the dimensionality. So we usually transform them into um, another, we usually transform, transform them and we call them keys. Um, and uh, we operate directly on the keys with reduced dimensionality. And if I'll be given, like think about the target decoder, decoder uh, states for every state, I'll be summarizing the input set uh, given a different query. So, um, so I'll be given uh, a set of queries here. So this is the jargon that is being used in the community: queries, keys, and values. So if you see that, um, you know, if you heard about them, so that's the reason why you're calling. And at the end of the slide deck in the appendix, there is also a detailed section going over the vectorized um, computations of what an attention network does. But let's look at how uh, the, 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 the how we can uh, compute uh, one of these uh, one of these weights. Um, so the the basic I, I mentioned we are going to be measuring the relevance of the query with every input of this uh, input set. 
So how am I going to measure this relevance? Um, so it's actually with a similarity function, and the simplest one is dot product attention. What I'm going to be doing, I'm going to pick picking up my query, and I'm going to be comparing it with every one, every element of these input set. So here is the operation what we're doing, and so here it's basically the similarity function. In this case, we're using dot product. Then we exponentiate it to smooth to smooth it out, and and then normalize. So this operation is basically a softmax here. If I apply the softmax, so this yields uh, a, a value that is between zero and one. Um, and this is the value that, or this is the weight that the attention network yields. And if I have a, a weight for every source token or every source state, then what I can do, I can summarize the set by using these weights, basically getting the weighted average of the input set given these um, uh, learned weights. Uh, now, now let's look at the alignment. Uh, why are we calling it alignment? Let's assume this is my input sequence and I just uh, write it from top down. This is my input sequence. And for every like, attention weight, it looks like uh, it's color coded with green. The darker it is, uh, it means we, we put a lot of weight, the higher the weight, lighter the color, we put a lighter weight. So this gives me some an, a notion of alignment. Right? So if you look at the alpha here, alpha values here in this, in this column. So for this, and the problem here is uh, generating a Spanish sequence uh, given an English sequence. So if I'm generating, uh, I don't speak Spanish, but um, the, if you want to generate the first token or first output in the Spanish, so you probably need to look at, you, you need to start with a question mark. I don't know the exact word for this, but which uh, other state or token that it aligns or um, has the largest similarity? It's likely the um, question mark of the at the end of the source token, source sequence, sorry. And if I repeat this for every target token, every target state, sorry, and this gives me an attention matrix. So this attention matrix, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, one column of this attention matrix uh, it's some, some, it sums to one. So it's some sort of a stochastic matrix here, and it uh, can be interpreted as an alignment. Um, uh, so how we can use these attention networks uh, extensively to build um, larger nets? Um, so there are two common use cases of these attention networks. Just to remind you, attention mechanism aligns two sets of representations. So if these two sets are identical, um, you can think of it um, a consecutive, the two consecutive layers of, an, uh, of a neural network, um, or um, you can think of it a single, um, or a single layer of a feed forward net, but I want to represent it, extract features uh, out of this set, just like a feed forward layer, so it's feed forward neural net. So if these two sets are identical, uh, we call the self-attention, um, and it's, it's widely used in the encoder stack uh, of sequence, sequence models. If you heard about BERT, it's basically, it consists of only self-attention, um, self-attention layers and GPT-3 or GPT-X, sorry, it's using a max mask version of it. If these two sets are disjoint sets, like in the encoder and decoder, then we call this cross-attention and it's, it follows the same uh, operations with some masking, um, but it's commonly used in the decoder stack uh, of, um, of sequence to sequence models. If I combine these self, the, the self attention and cross attention, it gives me transformer um, and T5 or M4. These are all using cross attention plus self attention. And there is also one other additional trick. Uh, I can actually replicate the same operation multiple times, I can parallelize the computation, I can uh, spawn more self-attention networks for every layer or for every two sets. And this gives me multi-ed attention. Like putting all these things together, uh, like we end up with a transformer architecture. Here on the left, you see the encoder stack. It consists of uh, multi-ed attention. Uh, it applies some normalizations. It adds some capacity, that some feed forward nets. And it repeats this so the stack on the left multiple times to yield um, the encoder representations. And the decoder consists of both self-attention here. You see self-attention followed by a cross-attention here 
uh, that you see. And this, the left left hand side is encoder, right hand side is decoder. We reduce, we, we return back to our sequence to sequence problem using only attention. So how does it pro like how does the process and uh, input sequence and generates an output sequence? Here is a nice uh, animation, um, but there are additional components that uh, that play a huge role in the success of transformers. So they not only about self attention and multi attention or cross attention, they also apply careful normalization, careful batching. Uh, they have to be trained using synchronized synchronous training. It applies some, some label smoothing. It uses a different type of loss. It uses a different type of learning of learning grade schedule, uh, and so on. So all these tricks and techniques combined, it gives gives us the transformer architecture. And transformers are almost everywhere now. So they 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 completely um, um, say subsumed uh, the NLP domain, and now it's being used in other domains too, like machine translation, model, uh, language modeling, where Transformers are first introduced, but if you look at Alpha Star, transformers are also being tested. Uh, now, transformers using the very same sequence to sequence paradigm can do mathematics and theorem proving uh, with some tweaks. They can do music generation. They are used to 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 predict the uh, protein structures in biology. They are being also used in the, in the merger of vision and language, and also they are used solely in computer vision as well. So, and so you see this this architecture is quite generic, and I like I was able to find so many interpretations of transformers. So transformers are capsule networks, transformers are RNNs, gated recurrent units are you can actually um, come up to come up with a causal attention mechanism. They're Hopfill nets, they're graph neural networks. But the best explanation or best abstraction or interpretation that I like is they look like generalized V forward nets. But how? So let's look at two-layer feedforward net. So this is my first layer, uh, and this is the second layer. How I compute the, the state of this neuron or activations of this neuron? I basically take, so given these weights, um, I'm going to be taking the weighted average of the activations of the layer before um, to come up with the uh, activation of the layer um, Oh, layer above, right? So if you replace the weight with the attention weights, this is quite, gen it's, a, it's actually, it, it almost looks like an attention network, it's or self-attention network, right? But here, um, the alpha values or attention or uh, attention weights, they're not being updated in the backward pass, but they're being computed per example in the forward pass. So they are, um, so this is a little bit open to discussion, but they're quite generic. Uh, and I like this interpretation because they're, they look uh, like generalized feedforward nets. All right, a few takeaways. So these uh, networks or transformers are quite generic. Um, so they have fewer priors, like I don't have to process an input sequence from left to right. So that inductive bias is no longer there. So the, you're operating solely on, on, on sets, set of vectors or set of states. And they can, they are quite expressive actually. So um, there are recent proofs that they can represent large set of functions. They're actually too incomplete. Uh, and they do also scale. Like why, why like how, how I jump to the scaling, um, uh, scaling property of transformers. Think about the forward pass and the backward pass of a transformer. Uh, if you look at, the, if you look uh, internally, everything is connected to everything else. So there is a massive interconnectivity. So actually, I don't really have a flow of the learning signal problem. It's more of a problem, how am I going to stabilize this, the, the flow or stabilize the learning signal um, or the, 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 the activations in the forward pass. Um, and the credit assignment path, if you remember, uh, in the original RNNs, it was, uh, it was equal to the sequence length or two times sequence length. But in a transformer, the credit assignment path is equal to the depth of the network. And the depth is uh, most, most of the times um, quite smaller than the sequence length. So given all these things together, uh, what are the takeaways in general in NLP? And I think also applies to other machine learning problems. So we need two components. 
some basic components that are expressive, um, like conditional transform network, conditional transformations, self-attentional transforming is one example. We need these basic components that are expressive and we need to scale them up with more layers, more data, more compute, and we have to devise tools to uh, make them train. Okay, this is the um, this is the the first like fundamentals, and then we covered um, transformers and uh, and why do they like how do they scale and some basic properties. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the recent trends in NLP. But if there are questions, maybe it's a good time uh, to get some questions. Thank you, Aran. This was a very good talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yes, we do have some questions. Um, so let me read them uh, uh, for you. So the first question we have is, uh, while uh, zero-shot solutions uh, uh, perform well, the performance of models like uh, DALI and GPT is more influenced by large data sets rather than new innovative architectures. So what is your opinion uh, on this uh, getting bigger rather than a smarter approach? It's a combination of two. I would like to talk about the scaling laws shortly in the recent trend in this section. Uh, so um, in so the, 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 all these components are actually connected. If you want to scale more, then you need more data, right? If you, if you don't scale but ingest a lot of data, then you'll likely underfit. You can devise, um, you can devise quite complicated architectures. But at the end of the day, the architecture that has less inductive biases and that can ingest a lot more data, it's probably going to win because we have a lot of data. OK, so I'll also talk about this later, like in a few slides, actually. But yeah. OK, nice. Um... OK, so then the next question we have is, um, uh, is it meaningful to use attention plus sequence to sequence uh, uh, in scenarios where we have a relative, relatively short sequences? Um, it might be an overkill. Um, yeah, it might be an overkill. But yeah, I don't know the exact problem. A relatively short sequence, if the sequences are between, I don't know, 10 to 50, I would still use sequence to sequence models. And it's more, more of a question, um, um, like a source sequence and target sequence, are they um, equal length or not, right? If they're not equal length, then uh, sequence to sequence paradigm is um, it's quite effective. Thank you, makes sense. Um, so maybe we can take another few questions and then let you go on with the talk. Um, sure. So another one we have is, um, uh, can you comment on the limitations of language models uh, along with the, sorry, along the dimensions of ethics, uh, particularly when it comes to perpetrating stereotypes? So how do we uh, overcome such limitations uh, that uh, Tim Nitt Jebro was hinting at weeks ago? Uh, I, um, it's, the problem is what exactly? I didn't get that. So I think the question is basically, um, can you comment on the on how uh, language models uh, um, on the issues of language models uh, with respect to ethics uh, and uh, uh, bias oh, okay. uh, and uh, you know how how can we uh, overcome these limitations? How can we overcome is an open research question um, that large uh, groups are actually working at the moment. But I I agree with the uh, with the sentiment. Um, so as we ingest a lot more data, so we are basically um, covering a lot of more, a lot more domains. I talked about um, like the data sets that we're using is covering the entire web, and you're increasing the the domain coverage. But uh, as you increase the coverage, you also hit some malicious input uh, or unintended uh, or the worst case scenario. The probability of you getting a worst case scenario is increasing. Yes. How to mitigate? This is an open, um, like it's an open research question. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, that's all I can. Okay. Control. Thank you. Um, so one question that is very upvoted now is: uh, Do you think that attention weights can be considered or uh, give a kind of uh, interpretability, explainability of model predictions? 
There is also a lot of debate. Last year, there were a couple of papers. Um, attention is explanation. And there was another paper, attention is not explanation. And there was another paper, attention is not, not explanation. So it's so for some problems, yes, you can use attention weights to interpret what the model is doing. But it's, it's, if you're looking at the inference dynamics, infer, inference, uh, inference time uh, statistics of the attention, but it's, it's, don't forget, it's also helping a lot in the backward pass. It's also helping us a lot to learn or fit these models. So yes, for some problems, they give, give us, a, um, give us a, a handle or give, give us a tool to interpret these models. But um, I personally wouldn't trust them um, say fully. I wouldn't put all my bets on the attention weights. Yeah. OK. And so maybe we can uh, answer this last question and then uh, move on. Um, so I did not quite understand the attention mechanism and the transformer architecture. What is the key intuition that makes it so good? Everything is connected to everything else. And everything is a, is a weighted combination of everything else. So if I'm, if I'm an element of the set, I'm going to be representing myself with the weighted average of all the other elements in the set. This is how I build up my representations. So this uh, this massive interconnectivity is, I think, the key in attention. But of course, this is my interpretation. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the, the nice intuition here is that when you uh, emit one uh, element of the output sequence, uh, you can uh, uh, put attention on uh, several elements of the input and you can wait with this attention to select uh, some more than others. Um, so yes, maybe we can continue with the talk and then uh, we have plenty of questions, so. <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, I wrote here, let's take a pause, but we took the pause already, but let's zoom out a bit first and let's look at what's been happening since 2010. Um, so in 2010, this is this is also the time that I entered the NLP uh, realm. Uh, embeddings were everywhere. Continuous space representations or representations of words, the simple arithmetics, they were everywhere. Then came the the wave of returns, RNNs, and then it was followed by attention, and then it was attention that like uh, the community noticed they can scale, and I can actually train large models, uh, compared with large models. And then I can reuse the representations that I learned um, by ingesting a lot of data. Uh, and that, that opened up the transfer era. So reusable features, the sample efficiency, um, uh, it yielded architectures like Birch, T5, GPT-1, and 2, XLMR, and Roberta. Now we are in the phase of scaling. Now we're not only ingesting a lot of data, we also scale the models dramatically. What enabled this? Um, I think uh, one crucial component I mentioned earlier, systems developed uh, as we actually follow these blocks, the, these boxes uh, throughout the years. Systems developed, tools developed, um, we, built, we, we built chips that, that scale particular models uh, quite efficiently. And now we are at the era of scaling. So more compute um, for the first time uh, to my knowledge in machine learning, uh, first time in machine learning, more compute and data uh, is giving predictable gains. And it's also simplifying the meta learning. That was the first example that I showed. Meta learning is actually reduced to in context learning or manipulating the inference time uh, query or inference, inference time input. And new capabilities appear also discontinuously as we scale these models. Few examples are GPT-3, M4, and some others. And where are we now as a field? If I want to, if I would like to summarize, so now we are training large neural networks on colossal amounts of data on hundreds of languages and tasks. And these networks do generalize the new task with few shot learning, sometimes without any gradient descent or updates. And these networks also uh, guide or interact other modalities not only text or speech. Um, so these networks are not only not large, they, 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 they not only generalize to new tasks, they also are, they're also very accurate. So their quality is quite good. So what we can tell about, like how we can categorize this, 
The first one is scale. The second one is generalization. The third one raises the question about the parity. I mean, human parity. Let's go over them one by one. So what about scale? Uh, I just did a search, uh, a number of neurons in the brain. How many connections are there in the human brain? 10 to the power of 15. I, I prepared the slides um, uh, last week, but I updated the slides a couple of hours before because we hit, uh, we, we reached a milestone quite recently. So here is the, the number of synapses in biological systems, and I'll overlay the artificial systems. The attention network that I showed, it was around 25 to 50 million uh, synapses. Then there came transformers. It had around 400 million synapses. Then we had a lot of models. Um, the first variant of GPT, Google T5, they were around 10 billion. And we had um, GPT-3 and M4, they were uh, varying from 175 billion to 600 billion. And this, I think today, a couple of hours ago, um, a new model introduced switch transform, it has one trillion weights. What does it tell? So does parameter counting or counting flops correlate with model complexity? So this is why I, why I put this caution. So this is an open problem, and this is waiting, us, waiting for us to study. Uh, I just counted the parameters, but it doesn't necessarily mean these models are increasing in terms of their complexity, in terms of the function that they can represent. And also, um, this relationship between these, like now I'm, I'm scaling them to trillion weights, but I have a fixed, uh, fixed amount of data, so they're becoming over-parameterized. So how does this over-parameterization uh, affect um, interact with memorization and generalization? So these are, again, open questions. Um, the first two here are like waiting for us to, uh, to, be, to, to study, but the last one, um, I want to refrain coming up uh, to the conclusion scaling leads to intelligence. I think that requires another debate. Uh, okay, scaling seems to be working, but why? Um, then, um, but like, why, 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 why scaling works? So because the, the observation is, as we scale, empirical observation, as we scale, things seem to be generalizing better, uh, meaning accuracy on test distribution is getting better. Let's look at a few examples here. On the x-axis, we have the release date and number of parameters. So it's like here, um, we're going from GPT-3, GPT, first version of GPT to BERT. Uh, the quality was improving. And then uh, around 2019, as you see, the trend is also going up. We are increasing the number of parameters. And these models are getting, and getting better and better in terms of their generalization capability. And very recently, and this is actually a, a followed throughout the year 2020. Um, just to checkpoint, the models being built um, scaled by three orders of magnitude in, three, in two years with consistent improvement in the end quality. Um, so there is also some like uh, governing scaling laws. These are empirical laws, but um, so folks from OpenAI were able to fit some um, uh, power laws on different problems. Um, and they show you can actually um, you predict the, uh, the, 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 the test error uh, given uh, the number of parameters are computed. And another, uh, another observation uh, that, that we see uh, that emerges out of scale is there are new capabilities emerging as we scale these models. So they here on the x-axis, you're seeing number of parameters. This is GPT-3 and y-axis is the accuracy. On some task, as you see, the model seems to be catching up new tasks as we give it more capacity. And this, this, continuous, this continuity is the key as we scale. So it's not really like a monotonic increase. Um, some capabilities emerge uh, after some certain number of parameters. Also a new paradigm in meta learning. So on the left, you see uh, the classical or the old paradigm uh, that, that I called transfer. You pre-train and then fine-tune, but on the right-hand side you see in-context learning. That's the new paradigm that I only that I don't don't apply any gradient updates, and the old learning happens at inference time in context. So no parameters up, parameter updates uh, updates are applied. Uh, given enough, given long enough uh, context, uh, we can cr cram in a lot of examples uh, for the task that that I want to um, that I want to do. And then the models are 
that they, at least the GPT-3 is quite good at is few shot generalization um, in the in this new paradigm of in context learning. So I want to okay, this is the machine learning this is machine learning summer school. So let me pay my dues here and let's take a side step uh, to deep learning theory. So there is there seems to be an interplay between some concepts uh, from learning theory. So I talked about generalization, but it is related. It's actually interacting with expressivity and optimization. And there are a lot of groups right now studying why do large neural networks generalize better? Again, pretty well on unseen examples. Uh, from classical bias variance dilemma um, point of view, what we know is as we increase the expressivity, we sacrifice generalization. But um, in practice or at the age of this modern neural networks, increasing expressivity results in increased generalization. So what does this mean? Uh, my, as, as I reduce my approximation error, uh, they, this, that also reduces my estimation error. So this is quite interesting. Uh, there comes the importance of optimization. So if you look at learning, we can decompose learning into two components, the optimization error and statistical error. In, in classical machine learning, these two, the, 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 these two notions or these two measures, they do not interact. But in deep neural nets, they seem to be, or uh, with, the, with, with, um, with, say, non-convex, non-smooth uh, functions with uh, many critical points, they seem to be interacting. Um, interacting, um, they they seem to be intertwined. Um, and according to some studies, these this, um, these two areas. Uh, sorry, according to some studies, or parameterization is also playing a role in this picture. And that connects us to deep double descent, which is a new look, new look on classical bias variance dilemma. Uh, but I should say, of course, generalization goes beyond optimization and statistics. Uh, it also touches the causality, compositionality, and more. So I think I've thrown uh, a lot of buzzwords. I feel I should stop um, and leave this to the experts to be covered later in this. Uh, uh, in this summer school. Okay, let's return back to our generalization. This is generalizing to new modalities. Now we are also seeing uh, NLP uh, applications are uh, going to uh, other domains like vision. <clears throat> and the last point that I want to talk about is about the parity. So we talked about as we scale, that yields uh, improved accuracy. So the models are generalizing better and better. But what about the human parity? So there's there are a lot of debates, discussions. Um, are we uh, are uh, like are we as good as humans, or like what is superhuman quality, superhuman performance on uh, on some tasks and so on? Let's look at the the translation example. Here, what you're seeing. Let's pick up the, the this column. Here. Uh, it's English French translation task and 25 like we ask uh, at the same source sequence is translated to the machine and by a professional translator and we ask other humans to evaluate these two translations and what we see is like 25 percent MT is better and like 35 percent like human is better and there is uh, there's they, there is also a large portion that uh, they, they got the same rating but I should note, this is actually coming from almost two years ago. Now, the picture is highly skewed towards machine translation. And another, um, another, um, another input is, um, can we tell the G, the whether a, a generated text is coming from a model or not? So uh, in GPT-3, they did an experiment, and then they asked human uh, evaluators whether they can distinguish whether it's coming from um, GPT-3 or uh, it's a natural text. And as we scale more, which is on the x-axis, um, it becomes indistinguishable uh, from human-generated natural text. And we also see um, similar trends on, on several benchmarks. So this is squat uh, here on the x-axis. So here, this is the human performance here. And uh, y-axis is the, is, the, is, the, the, is the date. And again, the same trend in glue benchmark. So what happens if the, if, uh, if the submissions or participants surpass human quality, you come up with new benchmarks. So this is super glue. And I, I, I took this screenshot last week. Um, the week before it was okay, but last week there were two submissions that actually surpassed human quality. And so 
there, I, I picked up one a benchmark that the human quality was not passed. And I want to talk what is the inductive bias or how this benchmark is being curated. I just want to highlight the importance of evaluation uh, and benchmarks. So like this is extreme benchmark. Um, and what like in the extreme benchmark, there are multiple tasks that each one of the participants, each one of the participant the participating models are tested. Um, the multiple tasks, they're also evaluated on multiple languages. So here, uh, let's look at what we're exploiting. Multilinguality is actually um, is the key here because although all like although English, the English internet is dominated by English, it's not the case for all the other languages. By increasing, by making our models multilingual uh, or the evaluation uh, benchmark multilingual, we are stress testing the models to to operate well on low data regimes like uh, any other any language that is not English, basically. So we are making the, the task harder. And here, the expected inductive bias from the participating systems. Uh, this, uh, the, the models have to exhibit some positive language transfer from high resource to low resource. And they have to be simple, efficient, and sequential transfer. So again, I, want, I just wanted to caution. Uh, just um, benchmarks are great. It's, it's great. They're great tools for measuring progress. But they're not the end goal. Um, so we hill climb and tend to overfit. So don't, don't over interpret. That's my, that's what I keep telling myself. I don't want to over interpret the, um, the, the submission surpassing human uh, judgment. This is, uh, I think the, the, the last slide that I have, um, I talked about a few trends, but there are a lot of other trends. So my summarization was mostly biased from uh, what I work. So there are a lot of other trends. So transfer learning is still ongoing. Uh, it's a huge trend. Uh, it's a huge topic that's that's been studied by large groups. Um, so there are different types of transfer learning: sequential transfer, where you pre-train and then fine-tune on another task, or like parallel transfer that you learn multiple tasks at, uh, at the same time. There are different paradigms that are dealing with either multitask learning or sequ like parallel or sequential transfer. Um, the, we also are trying to increase the amount of information in the system. This is also another big trend. How are we doing it? We're making the sequences longer, and we, we, we ask the models to ingest a lot more data. And we also make the, again, we make the models multilingual, uh, increase the amount of information by showing them different views of the world. And learning without gradient updates, I think I talked a lot, a lot, a lot talked enough about this. Another thing that was also the question that was uh, that was asked, robustness and trust. So this is a big, this is really a big issue. So out of distribution robustness is still um, an open problem, especially for these large scale models. And robustness, robustness to noise. What are the worst case scenarios that I can uh, like that I can see in these models? Well, like, and you're also seeing a lot of black box or adversarial attacks to these models. And how are we going to mitigate bias? This is these are huge uh, areas um, that, that that we observe ongoing research. And last, efficiency. Uh, we talked about giant neural networks, but how am I going to make use of them? So, common emerging techniques are pruning, quantization, or distillation, uh, or making the attention more efficient by linearization, sparsification, or using kernels. So, I'll conclude with um, with this. Um, with this figure here, um, what I want to say is we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. I want to like highlight the um, overestimation here that is happening in the short run. As we overestimate, this is triggering the hype, and hype either disheartens people or um, annoys them, annoys the others. And this hype is usually balanced with underestimation in the long run. So I think we're, we're, we're putting ourselves into this vicious cycle by creating a lot of hype. This hype is countered by underestimation, the effect in the long run. But I think we have serious, uh, but I believe the, the, the models that we have have serious issues in the long run. And we shouldn't underestimate their power, or we, we should under, underestimate their uh, implications in the social life. So what we will be seeing this year, uh, my final words. So we're going to be we're going to be getting more accurate models in many many languages and tasks. 
going across modalities and they're going to be easier to use. With that, I think I'm over time and this is my last slide. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, it was a little bit, a bit of a rushed talk, um, but thanks for your attention. <laughs>